So this just records on a card? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've seen those. It's got pretty good, it actually works pretty well. And it does stereo, but it also has the ability down here to plug in professional microphones. Oh, the actually standard. Do, you can actually do a four channel recording if you, if you have a couple of external mics plugged in. Hmm. I got it originally because I was doing some video production. I was, I was t starting to do some more video production for the robot company. Oh. And I was really unhappy with the sound quality I was getting, so I was looking for ways to improve that. Right, so I that got this size the bugaboo is the audio. Yeah. Like and video then, on a cheap camera is good, but yeah. audio isn't. Yeah. And then, of course, the new guy came in who was not interested in having me do any video, so <laughs> all this stuff kind of languished. All right, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Uh, Bergman, thanks for coming. Uh, you were sick all night. <laughs> I'm kind of worried about the turnout, but it's going to be a very good and informative evening. Um, anyway, for the new people, Rock the Mountain is generous. So we're a 501c3 nonprofit educational studio, so I have a lot of wide diversity of content, I guess I should say, of, of things uh, for you, and I'm sure a few of the things that would be very valuable. Actually, a couple of years. Yeah, a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, so he's got some great insights. He's been an angel investor and worked in startups and worked in major corporations, mm -hmm. Microsoft. Oh, yeah, you may have heard of him. And construction, too. So he's, he's got a good you know, investor employee, you know, being on the inside and outside perspective. And, you know, as usual, always, you know, ask questions anytime. Don't hold off. So we have a good Q&A. Thank you. Hi. So, um, as Roger uh, implied, I've actually, I, a couple years ago, I came and gave a talk to this group about my experiences with um, Gamma 2 Robotics. And 
So I basically kind of resurrected that same slide deck and uh, tweaked it a little bit, but then added an epilogue as to what's, gone, what's actually been happening in the last couple of years. So um, I would like to emphasize that I'm not an attorney. And so if I say something that sounds like legal advice, you're, you're misunderstood me. You're mistaken, and I misspoke. And that's, that's not the case. So I'll give my personal opinions here and my, uh, my personal experiences. And this is just with that caveat. So my background is I've basically gone through a few things that I might call careers in my uh, time. The uh, first one was with the, my family's, my father's actually, uh, general construction company. It was a commercial construction, did a lot of government uh, buildings, at university buildings, a few towers, that kind of thing, larger projects. And I was doing pretty well with that. That was based out of the, uh, the Boston area. And uh, we bought a local Denver company as a subsidiary with the idea being getting the geographical diversity would help uh, ease the highs and lows of the business, which is very cyclical. And long story short, it seemed to work out for a while, but ultimately didn't, and closed the company out here, and I just decided I wanted to stay in Colorado because I like it much better than New England by a long shot. And so I stuck around and decided to go after another love of my life that goes way back to, boy, I think it was sixth grade I gave a talk um, on the evolution of computer technology, uh, hardware, which... You know, we're talking 60s, early 60s. Um, so I've always liked this stuff, but I was always sort of like playing around with it more like a hobby. So I went and got a computer science degree and went off and got a job being a software engineer. And everything from a small uh, medical instrument company called Sand Hill Scientific that was right down here in Littleton. They've since been bought, uh, but at the time they were privately owned, uh, they had a product, they were profitable but struggling to grow, so it may sound familiar to some of you, and a good bunch of folks, but I felt I wasn't going to have the growth that I wanted there, and I wanted to learn Windows programming, and we weren't doing that. So I moved from there and took a job at Quark, which some of you may recall is a desktop publishing company. They were a real big deal, and they've since kind of faded, and they're doing I don't know what these days because um, the original management was gone. They started out with Tim Gill being a software engineer, the uh, original genius, the founding genius, and Fred Ebrahimi, which, who was the business guy. And, you know, both of them got really rich. Tim Gill became a philanthropist. He ultimately got out and sort of changed the nature of the company when that happened. Um, from there, I went on and got a job working at Microsoft, where... Um, you know, I still didn't learn Windows programming. I didn't learn it at Quark because they had a Windows version of Quark Express, which was their big program, but they implemented it by imitating a Mac on Windows. <laughs> so really, all this time, I still didn't learn Windows programming. I have a vague idea of how to do it. I was at Microsoft for about eight and a half years and really was, had gotten kind of tired of the big company environment and I wasn't really... I didn't really care enough to be as competitive as you needed to be and successful in that area. Um, so, back to Denver, looking for something to do. And uh, a couple of friends of mine from when I was getting my degree, Jim and Louise Gunderson, who had gone off and gotten PhDs in, this, uh, in the meantime, had started a small company. Um, we, uh, which one is it? There we go. So come on. There. That's what I've been talking about. Now, this is sort of a timeline of Gamma 2. They started up in 2003 after they got their degrees. And around 2008, they had had some success with general uh, consulting type work. And they wanted to get in focus on an old love of Jim's who grew up watching the Jetsons and he wanted he wanted to build a Rosie, or whatever that Rosie thing was. 
So they decided to focus on robotics. They had a theory for how to make robots behave correctly around people and how to write the software to do that, to control that robot. And they'd been experimenting with that and felt that they'd gotten far enough into 2008 that they had a proof of principle and they thought maybe they could actually turn it into a business. So I was looking for something to do and they were looking for somebody to help run the business while they focused on the software and I was sick of writing software so it really kind of worked out. And I came on board as their operations manager and basically sort of ran the nuts and bolts of the business. Um, we did that for a few years and Gradually, the software got better and better. We iterated, iterated through various prototypes, um, which I got pictures of, I'll show you shortly. Um, when then it, things really started to kind of move in 2012. Uh, we decided that we needed to sort of get more professional looking, have a prototype that looked manufactured as opposed to something that you might have thrown together in your garage, which is in fact what we had done. Um, and so we uh, got together with a local um, industrial engineer, designer, who basically made us a chassis that he was fully documented, made you know, with parts from a sheet metal contractor and all this other stuff to actually be manufacturable. We had the full spec, we could do that. And at the same time, we were fooling around trying to find other ways to position the company and start up a, another company. Go ahead. I'm assuming for nine years there was some sort of uh, source of income for this company. Good question. Let me put that on hold for a sec, put it on the stack, get right back to you, because that, in fact, is when we start talking about what you guys are really interested in. This is all background and context. Anyway, so we took this thing to our first trade show in 20, uh, September of 2012. And you know, it did kind of okay, but it, we basically just put it together that weekend and drove it to Philadelphia. So it was amazing that it didn't actually just blow up or fall apart. We uh, retrenched a little bit, kept working on it. Uh, then we just realized, we were increasingly realizing, uh, up to this point, this had been self-funded between the Gundersons and myself, mostly the Gundersons. I had paid for the hardware development of that chassis, which by the way turned out to be much more expensive than I imagined it could be. But I said I would do it. And um, we were starting to look around trying to find outside money. And um, getting all sorts of advice about, oh, you gotta look like this, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. We did hook up with John Eckstein, uh, a, a really good attorney, a securities attorney here in Denver, and he was giving us some good advice, which we um, didn't really take. Then we had a recapitalization in the, August, the summer of 2013, where basically we converted a whole lot of this debt that the, the principals, myself and the Gundersons, mostly Louise, had put all this money in in exchange for promissory notes, which we were, we were told quite convincingly would scare off any investors because they don't want to see, they don't want to see debt to the founders. And so we converted all that to, to uh, stock and then had a thousand to one split so that, you know, instead of just having a few hundred shares of stock in the whole company, which means if you want to do um, something like a, um, uh, No, 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 I'm actually thinking the, the thing you do with the employees. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 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 I saw, I saw it, right, yeah. Sorry, I, that one just dropped right out of my head. Uh, you, you can't give somebody a quarter share, but you don't want to give you know, an engineer a third of the company or something. So we needed to blow that out, make that manageable. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, because we, we, there, may have been, there may have been current liabilities, but there's no long-term debt, correct. Uh, and we had some maybe overdue bills, that kind of thing, but no. Um, we, next step was to hook up with a professional um, business development fundraising outfit 
that we connected with called First Capital Development, uh, run by a guy, a guy named Gary Graham, who took us in hand. Uh, that you know, there was a bunch of searching around to find somebody, and this is who we ended up with, and kind of got us organized and went out and started looking for bridge financing amongst his various connections, which turned out to, it was like a convertible debt deal. And that took 2014. It was harder than expected to get that money in, but money kept coming in just in time, stringing it along through most of the year. Meanwhile, we were getting ready for a Series A uh, private offering. We were looking to raise uh, $3.5 million, which according to our business plan, would be enough to get us this thing launched, to get revenue happening, and um, get the company moving under its own power. And uh, Gary helped us set that up. We found out somebody who was packaging a deal. We'll call him Donald. And that came together in uh, March of 2015. And it didn't actually quite come together. Uh, the, uh, initially, we, the, supposedly the money was all there, but then there was some problem or other, and we decided to do it in tranches. And so we got a first tranche in, and then the rest of it kind of disappeared somewhere, didn't show up. And so we ended up with less money than we thought we were going to need. Um, and... Yeah, yeah, close enough. I got I got I got to say that there's things that I suspect, and there's things that I know. Okay, and I'm not here to tell you about things I suspect, um, especially when I'm being recorded. <laughs> but what I know was the was that the the balance of it didn't come through um, any time near the timetable that we were looking for. So I think I maybe answered your question along the way there. Um, so, that's kind of the end of that slide. Let me just quickly run through. This was the uh, prototype. That's Louise in the background. This here is a prototype. It was kind of it was octagonal, kind of a silvery skin to it, kind of shaped like a beer glass. And that was an early prototype that was able to run around under its own um, power and its own ability to find its way using various um, sensors. And then this was a later stage, somewhat bulkier, a little bit more authoritative looking, you know. Um, this we call Vigilus Prime. And that's Jim and Louise standing behind it. You notice it has a, um, basically a little wireless uh, pan tilt zoom camera on it. So the idea was the robot could patrol around, it could find its way around and an operator could look through that camera to see anything that was of interest that was going on. Which, by the way, I should mention, I kind of skipped over this part. Uh, what we had focused on as a business opportunity was a security robot, one to assist guard companies with their personnel problems, being able to field people, and something that could work in enough of a niche, because it's a huge, huge demand. And we felt we could, we could develop the technology to do this and maybe only get 10% penetration into this realm of uh, security guards, but that would still be hundreds of thousands of robots. So we figured we could do pretty well doing that. So the camera thing was, see the previous one, which was called Basil. Um, <coughs> That just sort of demonstrated the principle of the robot being able to find its way around. This one, by this time, we had taken a little bit further, and now we were trying to get it to do something useful while it was finding its way around. This was that engineered prototype that I mentioned that came out in, uh, we got out in the uh, latter part of 2012. And MCP stands for Mobile Camera Platform. And we had the same camera on top of it. All right. Now to your question. We, this thing was self-funded. When I came in, um, so Jim and Louise were the founders of this company. I came in effectively as kind of a blend of employee and partner. Um, I'd be an employee, except they didn't give me any money. 
but I did was able to buy some stock. Um, and, you know, at the time it was very cheap, it was dollar a share, and they only had like a thousand shares or something. So I got a few of those for a few dollars. And I was a part owner of the company, which in some ways made me, made me a partner. But it was really always very clear that it was Jim and Louise's company. And I was there to help out. Um, as things developed, uh, and I joined in the general enthusiasm, and uh, the Gundersons were starting to feel a little bit tapped out, I started picking up the slack and putting more money of my own in there. So that's how I became an investor of the company, is pursuing this dream that we had, that we could make this thing work and get rich. So, for a long time, easily starting as uh, early as 2010, we, and by when I say we, it was mostly Jim and Louise, but really mostly Jim because he's, he's a terrific pitch man. I mean, he, he could just talk to anybody. And, uh, well, you remember, you know, he's, he's uh, really good at connecting with people and communicating the vision. And they went around to I don't know how many different places. I, I didn't often go with them. Sometimes I did. Just trying to pitch this, you know, have their deck. They would go to some angel meeting or whatever. Um, and they would get a lot of polite interest, but nobody was writing them a check. And it was getting a little bit discouraging. And that's when we realized that we needed to get outside help because they'd been breaking their hearts on the pavement and not getting results. So that's what ultimately led us to First Capital and Gary Graham. Um, and I already mentioned to you the angel financing in 2014 and how we actually got the A round preferred stock out in 2015. So that sets the stage. That's, I think, you know, pretty much um, what was going on. We had a prototype that was, we thought, felt was fairly advanced. Um, we had a couple of employees and we had limited money and we needed a lot more in order to be able to hire more personnel, finish development and get some lar into some larger and better facilities and build some more inventory to get out there to field trials and start selling to customers, right? So we really needed, basically the, the way we should frame this is that what we thought, the position we thought we were in was we were really close to being able to sell to customers and we needed an infusion of cash to launch this, this into being a real business. Um, so, we've been trying, Jim and Louise in particular have been trying to raise this money, they hadn't, and so, In the immortal words of Harry Callahan, a man's got to know his limitations. And basically, the key thing is the skill set required. Okay? Developing IP or intellectual property, doing inventing, takes a really different kind of skill set from building a business and doing, being a business person. On the one hand, really emphasizes, in both you have to have discipline, but one side is really much more heavily weighted towards the creativity side, and the other is really pragmatism and real world, being aware of brass tacks and sticking to that in order to make these things work. Some people can do both, but those people aren't anywhere nearly as common as the people who can do one or the other. So, my experience on this, what I, one of my learnings was, you gotta know what you're good at and hire the rest. So if you are good at doing the inventing, hire management. And this is what Jim and Louise thought they were doing with me. And yes, I was able to do this stuff running the day-to-day -day operations of the company, but I wasn't really a person who was really, um, had no experience and really a skill set for going out and doing the raising of money and chasing that stuff down. So that was the big gap that we needed to fill. Um, as an aside, I've got this little note here. When you're hiring people, there's a couple of ways to do that. One is with cash, which is what you normally think of doing, and that creates an employee. And you give them a salary or a wage or whatever. Um, the other is with equity, with stock. You can convince somebody that this is an opportunity 
and we're going to give you a piece of the company and you're going to work your butt off and then when the company is a huge success you're going to be rich if that's what you're doing and that can work it absolutely can work um, what you really got now is a partner right you know you can really get down to how, how people are thinking about it if this is what you've given somebody and they're working for a piece of the company they're going to think of themselves as a, par as a partner and you really got to understand that about where they're coming from and treat them that way accordingly or you're going to have trouble down the road. So how do you build a business? It takes money, right? You've got to hire people, you've got to have a facility, you've got to have inventory, all those good things. So where do you get it? One is you can bootstrap and this really works very well if you've got revenue already that you, your business is you buy wholesale and, wholesale and sell retail. Now you've got some revenue coming in, and if you get a little bit of profit from it, you can squirrel that away and use it to buy a bigger truck or buy some advertising, get more customers, that kind of thing. So it's possible to do that. A lot of people do that. Another way is um, with OPM, which is other people's money. And that means you've got to find some investors. You need to find somebody else who thinks you've got a great idea, and they are going to give you money in exchange for getting more money back in the fullness of time. And that makes, that's what the difference is between, um, well, that's what investors are, right? So, how do you get investors? We, of course, had no revenue, so we didn't have the option of bootstrapping from revenue, right? Uh, we were still in development, we didn't actually have something that somebody would buy yet. We were still creating our product. So we absolutely needed investors. Um, you need to get help. We were in this situation because we couldn't do it ourselves. We didn't have the internal skill set. If you do, great. But when you start talking about raising money by selling equity to, um, and selling it to strangers as opposed to, you know, your, your rich brother-in-law who just made this huge killing and he's looking for a tax write-off and he doesn't care if he ever gets his money back and he has a spare couple of million bucks to give you. Got one of those? Good. But really, um, most of the time you're gonna be trying to find strangers who are interested in uh, helping to build your business by giving you some money. And now you're in the realm of securities law and you gotta, gotta tread carefully because there's It's complex, and um, it seem, it's seemingly arbitrary at times. And one of the uh, things that our attorney John used to um, chide me for in a friendly way was how I kept trying to get engineering grade logical answers to questions. <laughs> and he would just find, say, look, it's the law. <laughs> Don't try to make sense of it. This is how, you know, this is what it is. And you just gotta live with that. So. You need to have somebody who knows their way around with that. And the other thing that you might need help with is actually locating the people with the money. And one way to do that is you can have your pitch deck and you basically pitch it. Anybody will stand still long enough to hear it. Elevators, group like this, cocktail party, whatever. Um, you can do that. You may find yourself not being invited to as many events. Uh, and you may find somebody with some money. But it's the hard way, and that's what we kind of had been doing, although not to the extremes I was just uh, talking about. So another way to do it is to find somebody who does have contacts, who does know a lot of people, who have money that they're looking to invest in a high-risk venture, which most of these startups are. Um, people, for instance, who are very well, you know, have large asset values, and they're all set with their basic needs are taken care of with conservative investments and all this other stuff. And they've got this chunk of money off to the side here that they take on high risk stuff in the hopes that they'll get a high return. And if you know some of those people, that's who you want to get in for something like this. Because you don't have a proven track record. That's the whole point, you're a startup. Um, finding somebody who has those contacts is, is really important if you don't have those yourself. Now, if you don't happen to have somebody like that in your social circle, what do you do? 
can look in the yellow pages or Google it. And when you do that, what you're going to start running into is you're going to start finding outfits that do this for a living. This is their business, is helping people like you, startups, um, get the business organized to make it more attractive, whatever that takes, and reach out to their set of contacts and get interested investors in, present it to them, give it a bit of the cachet of their own reputation so that you, you, they have some assurance that this isn't just some total fraud coming off the sidewalk. Um, and also they know which streets to pound to go find new money beside, beyond their initial contact list. And they've experienced it, they've gone through it, they've done it many times. And these take the form of uh, business accelerators, these incubators. Um, there's, a, there's a fair number of, of them around, particularly in places like Silicon Valley, where there's you know, a software startup probably every five minutes, um, both coming into existence and going away. That can work, but you gotta remember, they're doing it because that's a business, okay? Which means they're doing it to make a profit. And there's a lot of ways they can make a profit, and one of them is to do hundreds of these deals hoping that 10 of them really pay off. Uh, but you gotta remember, they're not doing it as just a complicated way to go broke, okay? They're doing it because they figure they can make a, lip, make a buck at it. So you always need to make very sure that you know what the deal is. Always read that fine print because I know one group we talked to was an incubator and we were talking to one of their um, project managers, salespeople, whatever, and we asked about, well, what happens you know, for co companies that don't you know, sign up with you guys that don't make it? And he said, they, so she said, oh, well, we, you know, we scavenge out what we, what we can use from them. So basically their deal was they own you, they own your eye, whatever you develop. If you fail, they still own it. They come in, grab what they, what they think might be valuable and then sort of like get rid of the rest. You gotta know that. You may wanna sign up for it, but you gotta know that's what you're signing up for. You don't want that to be a surprise. So, You gotta have, let me see, how I wanna get at this. Investors are looking to make money. They're expecting to get a return, they wanna get a return that's commensurate with the risk that they think they're taking, okay? So if they think that you've only got a one in a hundred chance of making this thing fly, they're gonna want a hundred to one profit, roughly speaking. On the other hand, if it's a slam dunk, and all you need is like 50 grand to buy a new food truck because you already got the, you know, the staff to run, drive around in it and you can double your business. You know, well, a bank will probably do that for you, right? So how do you, you, know, so how do you tell where you are? And there's basically this kind of a, a scale. In our case, so in some cases you just have a great idea. You got a patent for your great idea, but that's it. Um, and so whether or not you can ever actually make that thing work and make it commercial is to some extent a leap of faith, you know, and maybe it's an educated guess or whatever, but it's, there's the huge risk side because you've got nothing but a great idea and there's a lot of those around. Maybe you've gone beyond that, and this is pretty much where we were at this point, which you've got a working prototype. You don't know how well it works yet because customers haven't been using it yet. So you've got a piece of stuff, whether it's software, hardware, or in the case of robots, both, which really kind of compounds the challenges. But, so that reduces the risk somewhat, but you're still in a highly risky zone because you don't really know for sure, an investor doesn't really know for sure that you can make it work at a commercial level. So next step up is you actually have got field trials, you've got beta testers, you've got it out there. Your product, your prototype is in use by people who are in your target market and they generally like it. They're giving you improvements to make, you're learning a lot, but it's not a flop. This is a much better scenario. As this starts, you can actually put your teeth into that 
as an investor, you can see what the complaints are, what the shortfalls are, what they love about it, and you can get a sense for how far you are from actually having a product. So this is a much lower risk, but it's still risky. And then, of course, um, the best thing is you got purchase orders. You actually have people buying the thing, and you just don't have, you need, you need some money to build the inventory, for instance, and to expand the sales force and things like that, because you've got something you know works. This is going to be a much smaller risk factor. You could probably get a bank to do that. And maybe you're just looking for distributors because you're already doing great. Again, that's a bank. Last question I have on this slide is, is it a business? And by that I mean, is it a hobby or is it a business? Do you have a plan for making money? Or are you making money already? Um, and if you don't, if it's not a business, then you're not going to get an investor interested because there's no way they're going to get return. You'll get rich Uncle Harry, who just thinks you're so darling he wants to help you with your dream. So rich Uncle Harry doesn't expect to get his money back. That's a gift, not an investment. So you've got to have a business, um, otherwise it's not going to fly. And I really want to point that out because you've got to be very clear-eyed about whether or not you really have a business. You've got to be very reality-based with that because your investors will be. Do you have a question or are you just stretching? Yeah. Not much, um, because generally that's not who's at those shows. You, the people who are at those shows are people who are bu looking to make deals, buying and selling actual product and services. Now, some of the big players have investment programs where they're looking for cutting edge new technology that they can bring into their stable and get some sort of exclusive on, and if so, if you can maybe make that kind of connection, but most of the time, that's not who's at a trade show. Now, the, we went to trade shows. We started, it started, our uh, first one was in September of 2012. And, you know, we got a lot of happy talk. We got a lot of, oh, this is really great. And, you know, oh, you know, congratulations. This is really, I can hardly wait till I can get blah, 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 blah. But nobody wrote a check. Nobody was signing the front of a check. And that's the real measure of sincerity. We had interest, we had excitement, we got real confirmation that this was not a horrible mistake that we were making. We got a lot of people who were in the business coming by, looking at it and say, yeah, you know, if you could make that work, this could really be, this could really be game changing. And like, come let us know as soon as you get it working. We'll buy one. But they weren't investors, but they, it was very valuable because we were also creating a market because there really wasn't much awareness that this sort of thing could be done. A security robot for the guard business. I mean, what? That's what people are for. But the fact is the people were part of the problem because these are low paying jobs with crummy hours with high turnover that you are demanding good judgment and a high level of dedication from. Those aren't the same people. Uh, you get students who are just doing it during the semester to help buy books or whatever, make ends meet. You got people who just sign up and they don't even show up the second day. Uh, there's tremendous turnover in these sort of the in entry level security guard jobs. And it, it makes the, the big companies, the hiring companies, go crazy. And if, you can, if we could offer them something that was reliable, we just do the job, even if it was a subset of what a human in theory could do, but it kept doing it and it didn't call in sick and it just didn't spend the night in the break room. We heard incredible stories, like one guy who there was, you know, the patrol, the uh, security guards do this patrol and they usually have little way stations that they have to check in at and this one museum they had it set up and because they kept changing exhibits they were these stanchions, these posts that had the check-in point scattered out throughout. This guy went on his first round with a little flatbed dolly and collected all of those, brought them to the break room, 
And then he just was going, duh, 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 for the, and then he put him back at the end of his shift. Just like, he probably put so much effort into not doing his job. It would have been easier to do the job. Uh, so they loved the idea. But that was the main thing we got at the trade show, is we spread the word about the product we were developing and got validation that it was, there was a market there. And if we could make it work, there would be people waiting to buy it. And so I'll get back to the whole trade show thing near the end. But so again, investors, what do they want? They want the return on capital. That's the whole point. That's why they're there. That's what makes them investors. In order to get that before they make their decision, they want to know, they want to see a business plan. And they don't want to just see wishful thinking. They don't want to hear hand waving. They want to actually see that you have identified risks and have plans to mitigate them. They want to see that you have a rational series of events and steps that will take that will actually result in profit at some time that's probably not too far away. Uh, there's no guarantees that it'll all work, but they want to see you've done your homework and that you're thinking rationally about what you're doing. They also, of course, want to see that you really care and you've got the passion because without the passion, you'll get through this thing and say, this is too hard. I'm going to go drive Uber or something instead. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to you know, work for whatever. So you've got to have the passion, but you have to also have, to have a plan that's rational. Um, most of the time, You'll have this rational plan and it'll come down to all we need is X million dollars to get this thing going and get us to profitability. And that's your big ask. They're going to look at it and say, does this make sense? And they'll decide whether or not to go for it. What's a conversely viable product? Well, simplistically, it's the right product with the right market at the right price. And all those three things have to get together, and it's just like anything else. If you see something you need, and it's affordable, you buy it. If any one of those three doesn't happen, you don't buy it. You don't have a sale. You don't have a product. And so you've got to understand who your market is to know what they can afford and what their perceived value is of your product. So you can price that, and you've got to be able to make sure you can provide that product for that price. Pretty simple stuff, really. But it's really easy to forget those kind of details when you're in the thick of your dream. Not the thick, but the, you know, the height of your passion. You just know you can make this work, but you've got to sit this down. You've got to crank through the details because the investors are going to want to see that. All right. So let's say you get some money coming in. You've got a, some, an investor who's serious, incredible, and has money. They have enough money to make your plan succeed. And they come in and they say, okay, well, we're going to want 50% of your company of equity in exchange for this money. Is that a good deal? Well, I don't know. If you can find somebody who will do it for, give you the same money for 40%, then no, you could take that offer. But there's always all these little strings. And they want to make sure that they have a big enough piece of the company to, A, make it more likely they'll actually get the return they want. And B, they need a comfort level that this thing, they're not going to give you a bunch of money, and then they have no control over what you do after that. And they'll, you know, so they, they want to, going to want to have a significant piece of the action on some level. And the thing to remember is if you start balking at giving up some of your company because you've been working so hard on this thing is, as a friend of mine was saying at one point, having 40% of a successful company is a whole lot better than having 100% of a great idea in terms of what it's worth. So investors may also be looking for new management. This gets back to the earlier talk about what are you good at, hire the rest. Maybe you couldn't really afford the caliber of management that's implied and necessary to really make your plan work once you get all this money. Maybe you think you're a good manager or a good CEO and maybe you're not actually as good as you think. 
this can happen, it does happen. Um, or maybe it's as simple as the money guy wants to know that his interests will be looked out for and he's going to tell you who the new CEO is going to be if you want the money. That happens. And you can either say yes or no, but you got to, you got to, when you go into these, this kind of a, get onto this advantage, this adventure, this path, you got to understand that um, stuff like that happens and you need to be prepared to answer those questions and, you know, stay cool because you got you know, you got to be able to work the deal. Maybe you could say, well, how about if we get a pool of candidates and your guy's one of them, my guy's, the, I got somebody over here who's be really good, maybe you'll like him. There's a lot of things you can do, but you got to anticipate they're going to want to have some assurance that their interests are going to be looked after. Um, Another interesting point. Up till now, you've been this really closely held small group of people working on your dream. Just like whatever hours you need to work, you've been working, you've been getting it done. And you've been making your own decisions and just making it happen and go, 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 go. And a lot of things are happening in a very informal basis. But now you're going to get some serious money in. You're going to have to have serious accounting controls you're going to be hiring more people, so you're going to need some sort of HR, whether it's a high, you know, if you're hiring HR or getting it in-house, depending on the size of what you're talking about. All of a sudden now, you've got other people's money. You're got to, you've got to be accountable to them. And this is just private. I'm not even talking about if you go public with this. I don't even, I'm not even touching on that in this particular presentation. We didn't get to that point. And so you're going to lose some of your autonomy. But again, you have to get back to that first question, you know, is 40% of a successful business worth it? To, you know, you're going to have a big piece of this thing. Is that going to be enough? And if it's not, maybe the consequence is you get nothing. And you basically have to go back and admit it's just a hobby. And last on this slide is this point that you may not like it. You may find that, in fact, it rubs you the wrong way and you just don't get along with the new management. And you get through it all and you realize, you know, this is terrible. I can't stand this. Uh, I'm out of here. And um, a significant number, a large number of founders actually leave the companies within a couple of years of getting this kind of money in and new management. They just chafe at it. Maybe that's a reason that they were entrepreneurs and innovators as opposed to employees in the first place. Temperamentally, they just don't like it. It happens. Um, so face that possibility. You may want to try to do things like negotiate some sort of parachute deal, whatever. Um, these things are really hard to think about at the time because you're so excited. It's like getting a prenuptial agreement, you know? Um, you think, oh, but we love each other and it would be like, it would. It, it seems like it would be so disrespectful and untrusting to have to have a legal document. And that's exactly how, how it is at the time. That's how you feel and it's the reality. Uh, but then, you know, a lot of marriages do go south and a lot of them go south in a really ugly way. But it's just one of those things that you don't really want to think about at the time that you need to think about it because it feels like it's a downer. So get a grip. All right, so that basically brings us up to where we were in uh, 2015. We had completed, we had finished the placement, the initial placement, the first tranche of this A round. Supposed to be for three and a half million. We actually only got um, 1.6 million in, in that first round. The, all these investors that had the balance uh, disappeared, evaporated, no money more coming. Um, this guy that I'm calling Donald um, wasn't able to come up with replacements. Uh, we managed to, there was one particular company, a venture capital fund, 
run by a woman who really, I think, saw the vision and thought we had confidence in us. And she actually participated in the bridge financing in 2014 in a big way. She was the last big investor on that. And she stepped up and gave us another half a million, which is nice. That was in the uh, late spring, early summer of that year. But that was it. And meanwhile, we started increasing our burn rate because we moved into a bigger facility expecting this money. And um, the new management was fairly well paid. And um, we had more management than we had before, like more people getting a good salary. So our burn rate just went up significantly. So, you know, things were a little bit tense. Um, and at the same time, we were having a serious reality check on the product itself. We'd gotten into some field trials uh, with a customer who was very enthusiastic about the, the uh, potential. And um, we went into their environment, which was one that we thought the robot could really do well in, warehouses. And we just had a lot of trouble. The robot could not be kept working correctly. And it was a very discouraging period. Um, scrambling to try to figure out what to do about it. And so this is mostly the gap navigation. It was navigation. Yeah, because when you really get down to it, um, the only thing that robot could do is navigate. I mean, it was basically, it was the mobile camera platform and the robot was the P part, okay? So you put the sensor suite on the thing and I have that stuff going on Wi-Fi back to central command, but the robot brought to the party was to be able to navigate and get around, um, not fall down a set of stairs, not get trapped by being in a dead end, um, being able to work it out if somebody had moved a desk or a chair or a wastebasket instead of being totally flummoxed and you know, basically parks for the night because some the cleaning people left a wastebasket in the, the foot out from the cubicle or something, right? So this is what the robot brought to the party was the navigation thing, and it was having it was getting lost, and so that was very challenging, um, and well, uh, then the new management felt that additional exp robotics expertise was needed and conducted a talent search, brought somebody in, um, and kind of inserted that person into the engineering department. And so the consequences was um, the founders found um, in a work environment that was increasingly unpleasant for them and uh, where they didn't feel like they had control over what they were doing and other things that I don't even know what may have been going on. But what I do know is they um, separated from the company and by 2016, they were both gone. I had also been replaced as chief operating officer, but I stuck around in a secondary capacity to help out for a while. But by the time, the, by, the, by December of 2015, I had myself become a kind of in a uh, leave of absence standby capacity. More complicated than that, but that's close enough. And so this gets back to that cautionary thing that I mentioned uh, just as a general generic caution that, you know, you may not like it, you may, and founders do, sometimes don't last. And this was a case where um, the Gundersons felt that they were better off somewhere else, and they decided to go do something else. Um, is this company still in operation? Absolutely. This is the interesting thing. Um, it's very interesting. It has been, yeah. So, the, uh, so what we ended up with was a new engineering department, or at least new, the head of it, the uh, software engineers, a couple other people stuck around. There was the, uh, the decision that the old robot, that MCP, was some sort of stylistic throwback to the 70s or something and completely inappropriate. 
And so it was a whole new robot that was designed, basically from scratch, designed by the new talent. And uh, some additional new management came in, as I mentioned. And then, of course, as I'll get to in a little bit, the ch familiar challenges remained. So um, I kind of mentioned this already. The field trials exposed problems and how to address those ended up with this, some real, exposed some differences of opinion, which turned out to be really kind of fundamental. And ultimately, I, I believe that that's what ultimately led to the departure of the founders because of this irreconcilable differences or something, you might call it. Um, this was the new robot. It's kind of a blurry picture because I stole it off their website and kind of blew it up a little bit. But, you know, it's intended to be a little bit more anthropomorphic and it's even got like, whoops, a little kind of a smiley face on the screen there behind its helmet. And uh, it also, it actually works better because it also has um, different design that is, uses um, more expensive sensor technology. And I'll put an asterisk on that and come back to it if I can. So, a lot of change. It's got to the point at this point, by the time we get into 2016, is there's almost nothing left of the, of the company that was there before the Series A round. We got all new management, the founders are gone. Uh, there's, a, there's a software engineer who was there all along and started as an intern. There's our manufacturing VP who was still hanging in there, uh, but it was all new robot, all new people really. All new senior management. Your target market's the same now? Yes. Same? Yes. Huh. Here, you, you, just, you just predicted the next slide. Um, so, the under familiar challenges. <coughs> they have managed to scr scrounge up some more money, enough to keep the doors open and keep moving this thing along. In the meantime, there's a new, new CEO. And there's a new, new chief engineer, robotics engineer, and um, some other new staff. And there's a new, new, actually no, there's still one member of the board of directors is the same. Gary is still there. Um, and so it's like a whole different company, really. It's like somebody took this idea and said, OK, that's all fine, great idea. Now let's do it our way. And which would be a great way to start a company, except they already, the company already had all this baggage, which makes it a very, you know, great challenge. Um, and so, one of the things that emerged was the so-called toxic cap table. Cap being short for capitalization. Capitalization table is basically the list of who the owners of the company are, how much stock each one has, taking into account warrants, options, all this other stuff. And you kind of boil that thing down and you can tell what the structure is of who's in charge, who can really call the shots because the, the stockholders elect the directors, directors run the company, hire, fire, CEOs, et cetera, right? So the capitalization table is key to understanding where the control of the company really is. And in our case, until the end of last year, um, the Gundersons and myself between us still had um, just about pretty close to 50% of the stock in the company. And that meant that what we, they would, what the people who were out there talking to investors were reporting back to us was investors would look at it and say, uh, I'm not gonna put any money in this because obviously you, the company is mostly owned by people who don't even work there anymore, right? And they got no skin in the game. We wanna see people who own the thing, we want to see the people who have skin in the game because the people who are actually working on it, the CEO, the chief roboticist, those people, they need to be more than salaried employees because salaried employees are gonna jump ship when they get a better salary. We want those people to have skin in the game, they should have that stock. So this is another thing that can happen unexpectedly as things continue to develop. Um, now your 40% of a company is what's actually preventing the company from getting the capital it needs to succeed because you moved on. It was really unexpected. 
And what we ended up doing was uh, making a deal with the three of us and the company to actually sell back a pretty good profit, really, um, most of our stock. And that made that problem go away, go, go away, and they were able to get some more money in at that point. Still working, still hand to mouth in a lot of ways. Should be having a B round before the end of the year, we hope. Um, the engineering task. So, this is the door. The mo so the money is still coming in, keeping the doors open, but still, you know, just barely. So still not enough money coming in to really get this thing airborne. But there's people who really believe in it, and they're working hard on it, and they're making progress, and they're making good contacts. So we're all still very optimistic that this thing will will actually turn into something because, sorry, the market is still there. You know, there's the problems that we are trying to solve are real problems. They're not getting any better. They're getting worse. And the security companies really want this. There's now competition. You've probably heard of, a, you may have heard of a company called Nightscope. They have a ro outdoor security robot that made the press not too long ago when it planted, we had a face plant in an ornamental pool, which of course was bad news for the business, but kind of good because raised awareness. Um, it's, so it's, it's a difficult thing to make this work, and that's why there aren't already a bunch of them around. But there's definitely strong demand, there's high interest, but actually getting it to work is, is really more challenging than it might seem on the face of it. And so it's, a lot of people are still working on it. So this is a good news, bad news thing. The market's definitely still there, but now there's more competition than there was in 2013 when we took our first trade show booth. Like iRobot, like I, interestingly enough, um, their main business, I believe, still is the military. And so they got a few of these consumer products, but you know, that's, I think, kind of a, a little bit of a sideline for them. And they, their man, their senior, they've had a sort of a dispo, dispersal of their core talent also uh, with the, when there have been differences in opinion about which direction the company should go amongst the original brain trust. And so there's several other companies that respond off of it. Uh, what I, my understanding is that the guy in charge of iRobot has made a commitment that they're not interested in artificial intelligence, which is what it really kind of takes at least there's, you know, some of that to be able to make this thing work. So basically, everything they've got is actually a remote-controlled car. You know, or, you know, basically it's a... I don't remember the names of them, but they have, like, the, the, the treaded thing yeah, with an arm, it and it's really, and it, you know, this stuff is really great for explosives, you know, uh, management or IEDs, that kind of thing. But they're all being driven by somebody. Well, they have the sensor technologies just to mount a whole crowd. Yeah, but those things are bumbling about mostly randomly. Yeah. Um, and if you're trying to do anything in a concerted, deliberate way, and it's a complex environment, right now the only devices that are actually really successful at doing that are being controlled by people remote by remote control link, and that's most of iRobot's core business. What we were trying to do, and the company is still trying to do, is break through that point to where maybe you only need somebody to intervene 5% of the time. Or maybe they only have to pay attention when the onboard intelligence says, you know, there's something big moving over there. And there's not supposed to be anything moving at all. And it sends an alarm back to Central Command who can look at it with the camera and say, oh yeah, there's a guy there trying to, trying to look invisible beside that plant, but our IR picked him up. And then, then they can, can call in like the armed response people, because the robot, not going to be armed. Not for a long time yet. So, does that answer that question? Yeah. And so, really, this is, this is the thing that makes it so hard is actually developing the onboard intelligence to act in a manner that's reasonable when you're around people and in human environments, which it turns out to be really hard to do. How many um, advanced things are installed around the 
still doing right now, they're doing, a, um, they're doing pilot projects in a much more organized way and kind of did a reset on that. And they're building, like, I think there's maybe a dozen or so of them like that to go out to various pilot projects. So there's, they're putting it together. Is that where like they use the facility that the people buy with that they deliver? Yeah, basically. Um, I, I don't know the details. I'm pretty much out of the loop right now. Okay, so I get the president's letter and I can go to the website and I get a little bit of feedback, but my inside contact finally left. And so, uh, you know, it's, so my understanding is basically what they're trying to do is essentially do a rental arrangement where the people who are doing the trial actually pay for it. Um, but they're probably not paying a huge amount, right? But enough to cover expenses. Um, and they got they're working a deal with Microsoft and the local facility and they're talking to ADT and they're talking to um, uh, one of the big card companies. Yeah. Some sort of like building specific things to help guide the robot. I know the robot was completely autonomous and could navigate in any Absolutely. building that didn't need special. Yes, because uh, that kind of infrastructure is expensive to deploy, and um, anytime you change anything, it has to be changed. Uh, so when you do remodeling or you move the furniture around, you've got problems. Yeah. And so. Um, People are just not going to, it's not going to get the market penetration if you have to do all that work about installing stuff. And the stuff often is not that reliable anyway, like tape on the floor gets ripped up by floor cleaning machines, all those things. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you could get away with in somebody's home if they think it's cute and it's not too obtrusive uh, that just won't fly in a commercial establishment where basically what you're trying to do is say, hey, look, instead of having 20 guards sharing three shifts to cover this facility um, for this much money, uh, we can put you know, five robots on one of those shifts to help three, you know, two guards for that shift because everything's closed. It's the, it's the, it's the graveyard shift, right? And so you don't have to worry about the guards being able to like, help visitor, visitors find the office that they're trying to get to because they're lost and whatever, all that kind of other stuff that happens. Basically what you want is a tripwire to tell you if something's going on that needs a higher level of attention. Because most of the time, nothing happens, which is part of what makes the job so deadly, right? Because you're sitting there and you're saying, why am I doing this? Nothing ever happens. So, um, what's your uh, comparison of the, the Amazon Kiva? Mm -hmm. Now, those have building infrastructure that they have. Absolutely. Yes. So, that's a whole different targeted, very specific environment, and they don't let people into that area. People, and like this is, let me, I'll get to you in just a second. The, the huge success is industrial robotics. I mean, it's amazing. It's taken over the factories, and that's. You know, that's one of the big reasons that there's been a lot of job loss in, in manufacturing is because the industrial robots coming in, they put them in there, they bolt them to the floor right next to the assembly line. Everything is tightly controlled. The parts are exactly where they're supposed to be because that's automated. The chassis is exactly where it's supposed to be. So the oh, robot arm just goes, grabs this thing, puts it here, zaps it with the arc welder, and the thing moves down to the next station. And it does that over and over and over again, flawlessly. But it doesn't give a damn if there's a person standing where that part's supposed to be. It'll grab the thing that's there, put it up here, and go <laughs> And if that turns out to be somebody's arm, then you know, that's what gets put on that car. They don't weld too well. So people are excluded from the operational area of these things because those things work and they're so effective and they were they could be developed in a reasonable fashion only be because a starting assumption is it would be a human-free environment so they wouldn't have to worry about avoiding, hurting people, okay? 
Kiva is exactly the same way. They're industrial robots. They know exactly where they are and where all their other little Kivas are as they're zooming around with these pallets on their heads in this warehouse area. Yeah, and there's a fence. They're just like barely yeah. Oh, yeah, because they know exactly. It's like, it's like an amusement park ride that's on rails. You know exactly where that thing's going to go. And it makes it look close, so it's very alarming if you're on that thing, but it's, you know, it's on a track. And so the people are all behind this fence, this railing, and they don't go in that area. They're not allowed to, and that makes everything much simpler because you don't have to worry about not hurting people. You don't have to worry about somebody leaving their chair right where the, where the pallet kiva is going to go running through there and have a crash. Right? <laughs> Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. If you had company X, you know, with this security you got, had an interesting set of cameras yeah. that had infrared technology as well as motion sensing technology that would automatically alert and or... Oh, you mean like fixed cameras bolted to the yeah, wall? But yeah, but had, you know, an entry network on it. So what was it that your thing provided over something like that? Yeah, good question. Um, Ours is much more versatile. If you have um, a bunch of cameras on the wall and now you've changed your racking system, one of those cameras is now behind a rack and it's worthless until you move it and moving it may not be cheap. So the robot just finds its way around because that's what it does. Um, cameras are cheap. You can get cameras real cheap. Installation costs a certain amount because there's professionals doing that manually and they're climbing ladders and all that stuff. And you, to some extent, you have to have people watching them. You still, there's still motion detection and those things which really help a lot. And so that's less of a factor. But it's really, it's, it's kind of, it's, if you had this place, you know, you could have, you know, camera, 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 camera. And then someone, come, someone comes along and puts this thing here, right? And maybe that camera can see it okay, or that one can see part of it. But then maybe someone else puts another thing in, and now all of a sudden you've got dead zones. And what do you do about that? So basically, the way to look at it, the way we, the company looks at it, is not so much, gee, is it possible to install enough cameras so that they do the same job? Because the answer is, yeah, sure. But why do they still hire people to be security guards? And why don't they just put those cameras in? And it's just a matter of cost effectiveness. And if we can give them a robot that will replace, will allow them, see, we want to be very careful because we're not actually replacing human guards, per se. What we're doing is we're allowing force reductions, which the reason that's different is that the robot still isn't capable of doing 100% of what a, a human, an awake, an aware human who's paying attention to their job can do. There's things the robot can't do yet. You know, if I'm a human guard and I'm going down the corridor checking doors, and I'm at the end of the corridor and it's the middle of the night, nobody's supposed to be there, and I hear a door open behind me or, and, or close, you know, if I'm at all conscientious, I'm gonna turn around to see what that was. Getting the robot to do that requires a tremendous level of sophistication because it's got to be able to identify that sound as being one that was inappropriate. But at the same time, not go twitching around every time there's a thunderstorm rattling the windows. Um, if someone left an oscillating fan and it's blowing the curtain around, you don't want the robot freaking out calling the police for an armed response. But if there's somebody standing there kind of moving around, you do. And this is really tricky stuff that humans do. Um, quite easily. I mean, this is, we don't even think about how easy it is for us to do that. And this is what makes the, this is a technical challenge that's so great. But it, we believe it's solvable at, at least at the level where you can maybe take care of 80% of what that individual is doing, which means maybe in a team of five, you could maybe have robots doing enough of the work that you only need a team of three, say, or something like that. And they got the robot just going around 
letting you know that there's something that needs a human attention. This is the basic marketing theory, and it seems to be one that resonates with customers. And then over time, you get better and better. Who knows where this ultimately leads? And that's, that's where things get interesting and scary or beautiful, depending on your outlook. Um, did that answer that question? Okay. So let me get to the last thing here. If I knew then what I know now, would I still do it? And the answer is uh, maybe, but I would definitely try to you know, do some things differently. Um, I really think that we didn't push hard enough to get pilot tri field trials and pilot projects going earlier. And I think that, that would have given us that reality check sooner and we would have been that much further ahead of the game. We would have known where we were and maybe if we had to do a reset on development, then we could have done that um, quite a bit earlier. And that would have made, meant that we could have made much better use of the money that came in when it did come in. So instead of you get like a very embryonic product out there, yeah. We did a lot of testing in-house, but, you know, you can only test th of things you think of yourself. And you, unless you happen to own a city or something, there's a limit to the number of environments you can test in if you're doing it in-house. How big is your house? And so the other thing is that if we'd had more field trials, I think that would have made us more attractive to investors and it would have been able to get made it easier to get the money in, and I think that's where the current management is heading. Um, I think we should have started the trade show circuit later. It costs a lot of money to set up a booth on a trade show. It costs you something like 10000 or more just to rent those um, five, you know, those 50 square feet, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's ridiculous. Those little booths are 5 by 10 or something, right, or 8 by 10. 10 by 10, that's it. Um, for a little booth, paying big money just to rent that floor space for a few days. And then you got personnel have to travel to the place. You got to get your product to the place. You got to get all this stuff and these displays and all this other stuff. It's a huge expense. It will cost you twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to do a trade show. And that's if you're being fairly modest. Um, so it's very expensive. You got to have really good return for that. And the main thing, as I said earlier, that the people are going to trade shows to buy and sell products. That's what really is the main thing that's happening there. We learned a lot about the potential market and the requirements of the market. We could have done that without having a booth. We could have gone and talked to people. So we could have gone, got a, uh, got a, a, a visitor pass for very small money, got a hotel and a, and a plane fare, and we could have learned a lot, but for a lot less money than actually setting up a booth. So we were, I think we were premature on that, and we could use that money for doing product development. Um, when you say new product development, are you talking about hiring someone to... Yeah, hiring more personnel. Um, being able... See, one of the things... Uh, this is an asterisk that I put down earlier. This thing about uh, being able to develop the product for a cost that allows you to price it at a point your market will support, right? You can't, it can't cost you more to bake, make something than you sell it for. That's not a business. We were, um, what we were doing, which I later came to understand was a, was a mistake, was that we were using inexpensive components. We were doing our development based on trying to keep the cost of goods sold within the range that we needed for our target price, okay? And that handicapped us in terms of being able to do the fundamental work about getting basic things about navigation going. When we were in the process of acquiring this additional robotics talent, we did a bunch of interviews with some pretty smart people. And one of them made this comment that really should have been blindingly obvious, and it was in retrospect. And he said, look, first you make it work, then you make it cheap. He said, you know, if you need to put in a, a $500 sensor to see if you can actually build a map on the fly and have the robot read it, then do that. And once you get the robot actually making maps and following and not getting lost, then you can see if there's a cheaper way to 
replace that sensor. But if you say, well, I can't spend that, I can only buy a $10 part, you'll never even get to the point of knowing whether or not the robot could work. And we kind of did that to ourselves a little bit. Um, so that ties into the question, what you do with that money is, you could spend more on your development, both parts and labor. Sure there is. Yeah, we had a price because the idea was, hey, look, for, for the cost of one, less than one year's salary of one of these guards, you can have the robot. Right. And that's, it, that's a robot that's now working 24, potentially, that's to have recharge time, but it's basically working two shifts a day, no holidays, no sick days, no just not showing up for some reason days. And it's there for your, less than your cost for one guy's salary. That's a powerful pitch, but it says, we're gonna sell it for 40 grand or 50 grand or something. If instead you're gonna go larger and say, hey look, you get payback in three years. Well now, you're talking about $150,000. So, you know, uh, if you can't get it to work at all, it's again that, that you know, some percentage of something that works versus 100% of something that doesn't. If you can't get it to work, you've got no customers. If you can get it to work, but it's more expensive than you would have liked, you've got fewer customers, but you still have customers. You've got customers like ones that are in an environment where it's a hazardous environment because perhaps of radiation, and you can build a hardened robot, and now you can really get a good price for that because by the time they get a person that they could actually put in that job, and get them all suited up in protective clothing, et cetera, all the infrastructure necessary to send a person into a, a radioactive environment, say, changes the equation a lot, but really you haven't changed the navigational challenge of the robot. It's the st all you've done is you may need to harden it for the radiation. So it was an interesting, it was a powerful insight that I wish I had had several years earlier. But so basically, sort of like prioritizing where we spent the money, and I think we made mistakes in that regard. Um, and it took us a while to actually look for help getting money. We were still, you know, Jim and Louise were doing the circuit themselves for quite a while, and I think we probably should have gotten the clue that we needed professional help um, somewhat earlier. And again, sooner is better for all these things. And then, you know, if you have any say at all in who the new management is that the new money is going to insist on getting, really exercise that very carefully. Because you got a, you got a lot at stake as to, uh, on whether or not that person or those people are really compatible with you and your corporate culture. And that they really understand the business and not just some one size fits all MBA type or whatever that, you know, cousin Louie of, of, you know, the money person. Because um, that's obviously critical. You're, gonna, you're basically handing over the running of your business and critical decisions because that person has to have authority, right? You're gonna bring somebody new in. If, you don't, if they don't have authority to get the job done, then you're, you're just totally wasting everybody's time and money. You're just paying a figurehead. You can't do that. So you need the expertise. You need to make sure that expertise is going to fit in. Because uh, if they don't, you're going to get, you're going to have trouble. And it's, so it can be avoidable. Sometimes it's not, but um, something to watch out for. And my last one, which is internal communications. If you are a sole proprietor, and you've got nothing but employees, and it's just you, and you're brilliant, and you have the dream, and you've got the passion, and you know everything you need to know, pretty much, and you're getting it done, then you're great. All you have to do is talk to yourself from time to time. But if you've got, like, it Quark, those, you know, Tim and Fred, each with their domain, you have to maintain communication. You have to maintain a shared vision. And I bring this up because I think that that's it's one thing that happened to us a, a, a little bit at Gamma 2 was the, you know, the, the, the um, C-suite, if you will, suffered in, uh, a, 
a certain amount of breakdown of communication and I think we lost that unity of perspective and vision. And we were thinking about things differently, but we weren't really in the, in the, in the press of all the events. We weren't, we didn't put enough effort into making sure we stayed in sync. And that meant that we started having goals that weren't in sync and making decisions about how to meet those goals that weren't quite in sync. And that creates friction and you don't need that. It's bad for your business. So if you've got partners or key employees, work hard. If you ever get in a situation like this where you're kind of trying to rapidly grow a business with a big infusion of cash, that's a really stressful, extremely difficult maneuver. And it's going to put a load on everybody. And you're going to have new people trying to integrate. And that's the time when you have to be tight. You really have to keep in sync. So I think I have taken up a lot of your time, but I managed to say most of what I had in mind to say. So any other questions? Excellent. Yes, it is. And I, I don't know, what, what do you think is the best criterion to bring in, you know, that those early, like, second and third person? You... Like, you know, it's like the smaller you are, the more important mm -hmm. the person is, it seems to me. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. Uh, if you've got a company with 5,000 employees, you can use a dead weight VP. Right. You, can, you, can, you can survive that. I think... First of all, the per you have to identify the need that your the, the gap in your skill set that you're that's driving you to hire somebody. And I, I say skill set, but I should say capacity. Okay, your capabilities, because maybe you can do it all, but it's going to take you 27 hours a day. Right, you're inefficient. Right? No, you're not. Even if you're tremendously efficient, there's just so much of it. Right? That's going to take you 27 hours a day. Clearly impossible. Right? So you have to get, in order, and if you're not doing it all, if it's not getting done, it's holding the business back. And then you gotta say, well, I need to delegate, I need to offload some of this. You need to find somebody, you need to decide which parts of it you're gonna be able to offload and not freak out, which is tough. And you're gonna need somebody that you believe is competent to do that so you're not constantly hovering over them and yeah, doing their work for them, delegate. right? You need to be able to actually delegate, which is, which is actually a management skill that isn't as common as it probably should be amongst managers. So you gotta be able to do that. So the key thing is identifying what part you're gonna be able to delegate and then find somebody who can actually do that and that you can trust will do that. And it's gotta be somebody you can get along with. It's great to have diversity. It's great to have an alternate viewpoint, but if you just can't stand being around them, it's not going to work. You know, you, so having, you know, having, so, you don't necessarily want a carbon copy, but you got to have somebody that you can have a constructive discussion with, and maybe even have slightly raised voices when it comes from time to time. But you, but you got, you're in sync enough, you can get along enough, so that you, it's all constructive, and that you can continue to trust that person with what you've delegated. I think, and then you have to find someone who's willing to do the job for what you're able to pay. So easy? No, not at all, not at all. And sometimes what you may end up finding you're doing, sometimes this is where some of these incubators and some of these shared resource outfits are where you can go into a place where you're basically renting some office space and you're getting a share of the receptionist time and maybe um, some administrative pool and a telephone, someone answer telephones, whatever, maybe even an accounting department. Um, you can hire out payroll. There's a lot of things you can do where they're kind of, they're not really core to what your business is. They're peripheral functions that still have to get done. But they're doing things that all of us right. 
And so you can find companies that do that and they supply people and it's the whole outsourcing thing and that kind of thing can really work well for certain kinds of jobs. So you need to, again, it's like, this is the tricky thing. This is why not everybody does this, right? Because these are really hard things to actually do successfully. And knowing what you need to do clearly enough that you can actually make a plan to do it is, is uh, non-trivial. So, yeah. But that just, you know, all this being said, go out and do it. Make it happen because that's, you know, uh, it certainly is different. It's interesting and it can be exciting. And uh, it's definitely not like being an employee. It's a totally different ball game. Yeah, Anything else? It's your life, right? I mean, it has to be your life. This is what this is why. I, this is one of the things I learned is I'm not really an entrepreneur. I'm not cut out to be an entrepreneur. That's one of the things I learned from this experience, because um, I think I'm a little bit more comfortable being an employee. I'm actually more comfortable being retired. But um, you know, it takes a certain personality. You, you gotta, and you also have to have something you really care about that you're doing. Um, but if you if you do, make a plan and go for it. And I think it's going to be really terrific. Um, but it's not for everybody. And sometimes you have to try it to realize that you're, it's not for you. I think a lot of people get creative with their jobs. It's not for them. Yeah. They like that creative and they like the process. One of the points was like, even yeah. the small business is two things. Mm -hmm. Exactly right, yeah. Because one of them is exciting and fun and and interesting, and the other is really boring, perhaps, um, and not very intellectually challenging, perhaps. But nonetheless, it's it's got to be done. It's just like putting gas in the car. You, no matter how great a car you have, it's not going to keep <laughs> running if you don't put gas in it. So your point's exactly right. Um, and you know, I, the, so for some people, the ideal place is to be in. A, in some very well-funded R&D department where they can go nuts inventing stuff and then somebody else goes over and turns it into a product, you know, which can take a lot of really hard and but sometimes tedious iteration work. Where and, and then, but it's really good to have these brilliant people who can come up with amazing ideas out of thin air. So it takes, it takes, it takes all types. Right, and at each stage of the point, it, you see, this is the other thing that you're, you're hitting on there, I think, or it made me think of, is dilution, okay? And one way, to, one way that you have dilution is in, a, in the equity s scheme where you and your three partners own 100% of the equity in a company, but you need to get more money in and so that new money wants half of the company. That means now each of you now only has, um, instead of a third, you've got a sixth, right? Um, and you've been diluted. And now you need more money. And the new guy comes in and says, well, I want 50%. Now everybody is down, ratcheted down. And so, you know, you're finding yourself, well, now I've only got 10% of this company that I started. But maybe it's now, instead of a bright, great idea, it's a billion dollar company, and that's not too bad, 10% of. Um, but there's that dilution thing. And at every stage where you basically are hiring out part of the work or the problem, you're getting diluted. And so if you have a great idea and you've got drawings, but you haven't been able to get, make a working model, let alone a prototype that can be tested or any of those other things, and you want to hand that off to somebody else, you can do that, hopefully. But when they look at it, they say, well, I'm just buying a great idea. I have no idea if I can make it work. And so there's, there's a, effectively a dilution there that you are now, instead of having 100% of the future cash flow of this great idea, you're taking, maybe you're going to end up with 5% of it for giving that person the, the idea that they didn't already have. 
that you've got, and now you've got legal rights to the idea, but as an idea, it not just doesn't generate revenue yet. So there's all this work that still has to happen before the revenue, and you're basically hiring them to do that for you. And so that all that money, all that, what, basically what you have to give them is all that, that, that proportionate piece of all that future revenue. So, but you can do that. And that's another way to approach the whole thing is if you, if you just are full, you know, if you've got a lot of great ideas, you could write them down, you can get patents on them, and you sell them out here. That's a perfectly good way to do things. If, um, you just have to understand what your, what your role and what your place in the ecosystem is when you do that. Um, it's a mindset that you don't own the team. You don't really own the team. You can be working with somebody else. Mm -hmm. Your basic mindset is, well, if you're going to accept what we have, you're just gonna, it's going to work for them. Mm -hmm. Right, it's shared. No, it's an extremely good point. Um, if you're not, if you're not, if you don't have an open mind, if you're not still actively learning from everybody around you, um, you're severely disadvantaging yourself. And you're right. If you, as soon as you, even even if you don't take a partner, your concept, your point about not owning something, it, as soon as you actually go out there and you want to sell it to the world, you've given up a piece of something to get there, right? Is that what you're saying? But when you're working with someone, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's maybe if you're having a partner who's coming in, taking part in your department. Mm -hmm. And training apprentices, and, yeah. Yeah. That sounds almost Zen or something, but uh, I think it's a good point and a good philosophy of collaboration. There's, there's a lot of. Um, I don't want to get into that. I, th I personally, I personally agree with your perspective. Well, you still have, you, you still, there's a lot of ways to have things go sideways with, you know, somebody who you can't really even stand the smell of their lunch every day. You know, <laughs> it happens, believe me. But, so it insists on doing, eating their fish in the microwave or something, you know, I, and I don't know. But I think it's fun, it's, a, it's an excellent point. Thank you. Anyone else? Any thoughts? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Version 13.2. Because I, 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 one of the things that I thought of, like or in, in my fevered dreams, was we built a little hangar on this thing, right? And there's a dr there's a drone that goes in there and it can recharge off of this, the robot's main right. system, go out and fly over, get a bird's eye view when necessary. And not only that, there's a little garage between these wheels where little itty bitty ones can roll around. And, like little ants or little uh, rats, basically, you know. And they can go scurrying off and look underneath desks and look around corners. I thought, oh, yeah, absolutely. And they're all relaying in through the main robot, which then relays, relays, does some local control, but also relays back to central command. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, it's just amazing. I mean, I, I think that we are, one of the things that I, I didn't really pay much attention to robotics before I got involved with this. And one of the things that I really kind of, um, came to realize as we were, as I was working with this, this, these people and learning more about it, is that I really think that we're in a period now where there's a lot of people doing a lot of interesting and advanced work in on a lot of the various pieces of like 
you know, manipulators and the, uh, the operating software, the, you know, the control software and um, sensors and motivators of various sorts, motiv you know, moving it around. Um, and power sources and power supplies and storage and battery technology. All these, there's a lot of work going on and I just am kind of waiting and like almost like the other shoe type of feeling. I think it, it's gonna happen very suddenly. All of a sudden, it's, it's gonna come together in some mind blowing kind of synthesis where it'll be there. And all these pieces that are being separately developed will start coalescing and it's gonna like just totally change our culture and our industry because it's gonna be like um, the industrial revolution. It's gonna be like telecommunications, um, airplanes, you know, that just had such an impact beyond, you know, the Wright brothers managing to stay in the air for a couple of months to now we've got I mean, think of all the things we're doing with heavier than air craft. I mean, it's, just, it's changed everything. We, change, we, can, we can fly to our, our kids, uh, you know, parents stay at their university on the other side of the country, and make it a weekend trip. Yeah, I mean, we even think about doing stuff like that and it's like considered normal. And you go back a hundred years and that would have been what, a week of train riding in each direction or something like that, or get on a Greyhound, or? Yeah, so it's, it, I think it's gonna hit hard when it, I think, I just have the sense that, yeah, we see a lot of it building up already, and there's iRobots here, and there's all these other things going on in self-driving cars, and um, software robots that are running your appointments for you, and um, writing spam for you, and all these other things. Uh, but I think, um, I think there's going to be something happening pretty soon where a bunch of these things come together and it's going to be kind of mind-blowing. It seems like if you have robots running drones, mm -hmm. we're just like one step away from it. Yeah, and frankly, making the data processing small enough and light enough and low enough power requirements, you put it right on the drone. Or you make a bigger drone, which is what I think what you know the CIA is doing already. They just don't talk about it all that much. From what I hear, basically it takes multiple people to run a drone. And these iRobot things, basically you've got, you need a guy working the controls. You need another guy there who's like telling that guy where, what to do because he's actually watching the robot. And then there's another couple of guys who are watching these guys back because they're concentrating on the robot, not these other guys up in the windows with rifles or some guy to come around the corner with, you know, uh, machetes or something. And so it becomes this whole team to be able to work these things. The flying drones, I guess they have trailers with half a dozen people in them or something like that. And it's a lot of manpower, but the artificial intelligence starts making that easier and easier. Uh, barely even need a pilot in that airliner anymore for commercial aviation. Um, at some point, they're not gonna have one. They're just gonna have a guy in a uniform come in and be obvious about going in there and he's gonna leave through a little trap door on the floor and no one will know any different. I'm just kidding there, I think. You know, just like driverless cars. Uh, there's gonna be hiccups because society doesn't change as fast as technology. And when it gets to things that really matter, like having cars run you over, um, people are you know, gonna say, hey, wait, wait a minute, a little bit. But it, these things can really go, go get Take off. Anyway, so there. Any other thoughts? Well, thank you all very much for your time. I've had a great time chatting with you folks, and I hope you have a good night. Thank you.